of turning your Bible to Revelation chapter number 3. These words that we're about to read were inspired by God the Holy Spirit. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. So literally, I know that you, are, that you have a name, that you have a reputation. That reputation is that you're alive, that thou livest. But you're dead and art dead. You have a name that you're alive, but the reality is you are dead. There's a giant disconnect between what your name seems to imply or your reputation and the reality. You are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Make them strong. Those things that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. And please notice they need to hold fast. They need to hold fast and repent. I or if therefore thou shalt not watch. I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. Thou hast a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He or she that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will instead... Confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Let's pray. We pray, O oh God, that there would be one person here that is rocked to their soul with the reality of what they hear. We pray that there would be one here who is saved. We pray that there would be one here who holds fast, that another one would repent, that your church would hear these words and would be challenged by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is part two. Yes, this is the same text we read last week, and we didn't get enough done, and we're doing it again. There is a huge disconnect between the reputation or the name, which is that they are alive, And the reality, which is that they are dead. The world thinks they're alive. From the outside, it looks like they're alive. But Jesus says, actually, you're dead. What we have going on in this church and churches all across the United States, all across Europe, all across Canada, all across the world, is a huge disconnect between the reality and the truth or the reputation. And this disconnect is at both the corporate and the individual level. In fact, it's inseparable. The linkage is inseparable. In other words, you can't have a church full of born-again, Bible-believing, true worshipers of God, and the church be dead. It wouldn't be dead because it's full of people who love the Lord. Likewise, you can't have the opposite scenario. There is a linkage between the membership of the church and I don't mean roles necessarily. I mean the people. I mean, I mean the people who comprise the church. They're not saved. You say, well, where do you get that from? Well, did you read the words with me? Thou hast a few names in Sardis. There's, there's just a few. There's, there's still a remnant. But the bulk of the church is dead. The bulk of the church is lost. From the outside, it looks like they're alive. But in fact, they are dead. They're dead. And this is what we're talking about right here. Jesus knows their works, and this church is at death's door. How does this happen? How do you become a church at Sardis? Which you don't want to be, by the way. That's not a goal. How does a church end up a church at Sardis? What happens? When the majority of the people who participate in the life of the church are not born from above, blood-washed saints, 
who adore God and the gospel of the church or, and his church. When they're, they're not there, the church is on its last dying death. It's, it's on the operating table. They are putting that machine on. They're trying to what, resuscitate the church. It's dying. What path are you on this morning? What path are you on this morning? What path are you on? The, the, the gate is narrow. The way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Those who find it are few. The other way is wide, and it's easy, and it's, it's many on that road. What path are you on this morning? Nearly every single week I receive some news that causes me to wonder if a church member is saved. Nearly every single week. You say, just believe that they believe. That's enough. By their fruits, you shall know them. By their fruit. By their fruit. What mainstream Christian denomination isn't in decline today? Someone gave me a newsletter this morning at the 8.30 service. And these are the numbers. These are the numbers. 1970, 10 million. 10 million. 1976, 9 million. 1988, 8 million. 8 million. 2005, 7 million. 2010, 7 million. 5 million, 2016, less than 7 million. That's three decades and 3 million decline. 3 million decline. The lost numbers go 100,000, 162,000, 174,000, 271,000, 105,000, 96,000. The lost numbers are incredible year after year after year. What's going on with the evangelical church in America? What's going on with the church? Thomas Rayner writes, between 6,000 and 10,000 churches in the United States are dying every year. That means between 100 and 200 churches will close this week. This week. The pace will accelerate unless congregations make dramatic changes. And that's exactly what Jesus says. Repent. Those are the words. Repent. Make strong again the things that remain. It is tempting to blame secular culture, national politics, or church leaders for the declining evangelical influence in today's culture. If outside forces and culture were the reasons behind declining and non-influential churches, we would likely have no churches today. The greatest, the greatest periods of church growth, particularly in the first century, took place under adversarial circumstances, adversarial cultures. We don't need the federal government to survive. We don't need favorable conditions from Congress or the Senate to thrive. This book tells us what it takes to thrive as a church. This book does right here. This does. I know your works. Do you see the dichotomy? From the outside it looks like you're a Christian, but you're dead so strengthen what remains. Make it stronger. So what are the things that need to be made stronger in today's church at Sardis? I'm going to give you six. I gave you just one last week. One. There has to be a stronger commitment to Scripture. There absolutely, positively has to be a stronger commitment to Scripture. The church is walking away from the Bible. The church is walking away from the Bible. Walking away. Nothing is more of a litmus test as the one's personal orthodoxy than their commitment to the Scripture as the authority and the inspired Word of God. That's why you hear such emphasis. Hear the Word of the Lord. Hear the Word of the Lord. Hear the Word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. These are the God-inspired words. Why, what are we doing that for? Those aren't just empty words. We are continually trying to remind you that this is not another book. This is not Christian literature. This is a stand-alone book Unique in comparison to anything else in the history of humanity and on the planet. Nobody has anything like the Bible. Nobody has anything like the Bible. It's an incredible book. Number two, make stronger the exaltation of Christ and the centrality of the gospel. 
make stronger the exaltation of Christ and the centrality of the gospel. Make that stronger. Now, consider the reality that nearly everything, virtually all I know about God, Christ, the Spirit, and the gospel comes from the Bible. Comes from the Bible. That's why, that's why, as the church, Karen, walks away from the Bible, they walk away from Christ. You cannot walk away from the Bible without walking away from Christ. You cannot say, we're going to put less focus on the Bible and more focus on Jesus. The Bible is the revelation of Jesus. It is. And so there's an inseparable link between the two. When you walk away from the Bible, you walk away from Jesus. When you walk away from Jesus, you walk away from the gospel. And then you wonder why the church is full of unsaved people. You left the book that reveals God and his son. You left the son and the gospel. And by the way, this is not a new problem. Those of you that know church history know that Jonathan Edwards faced this same problem 400 years ago when he filled his church full of unbelievers. Study it. It's called the Halfway Covenant. Google it. It's called the Halfway Covenant. And he began to allow people, church members, without a clear profession of faith in the gospel to participate in the communion table. He called it a Halfway Covenant. Once you walk away from the necessity of the rebirth, the second birth, you lose it all. You lose it all. How can I be committed to Christ and not be committed to the word that reveals Christ? You can't. How does a church end up like Sardis? What, what do we mean by Sardis? Remember, Sardis represents, if you, if you don't remember anything from these two weeks of sermon, Sardis represents a church that from the outside looks like it's alive, but inside, it's dead. That's Sardis. Well, you start preaching anything but Jesus. That's what you do. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.12, we preach not ourselves. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. We're not going to talk about gardening. We're not going to talk about the weather. We're not going to talk about your finances. We're not talking about how you have a great marriage. We may do a seminar every now and then, but we have to. I was going to say got. We got to stay focused on Christ. We must. It's imperative that we do not lose the centrality of Jesus Christ. So I have on the screen Christ Jesus the Lord. If I was to pass out a simple little quiz like I give my students across the street in the academy, and I said to you, tell me what you know about the word Christ. Tell me what you know about the word Jesus. Tell me what you know about the phrase, the Lord. Would you be able to answer a single question? Would you know something about this? And you say, well, that doesn't get me saved. You're right, it doesn't get you saved. I agree. Faith in the gospel gets you saved. But you seem to want to add stuff to it, Pastor Sean. You keep on emphasizing all this stuff. Let me tell you something. If I told you I was in love with my wife, that she's the greatest thing on the planet, and you said, what's her name? And I struggled with figuring out what her name is. You'd wonder whether I loved her or not. Right? If you said to me, I'm a soldier and I never saw you in your uniform, I'd wonder if you were a soldier or not. What are you saying? I'm saying that authentic faith in the Lord Jesus Christ manifests itself in something. It begins to look like something. And part of looking like something is I need to know about this man who saved me. I need to know that Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one. The one that fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant. The one that fulfilled the Davidic covenant. He is the Daniel 9, 27 one. The one that was prophesied. I'm sending this one. That he is all that God said in the Old Testament. He was sending. He fulfilled it. I need to know that the word Jesus means he shall save them from their people. Matthew 1, I'm not going to be an ignorant Christian. I'm telling you right now. Ignorant Christians aren't turning the world upside down. They're filling up churches in Sardis is what they're doing. The phrase, the Lord, is the kurios. That's the Greek. It's the master. It's the sovereign one. It's the boss. It's the owner. It's the one that controls my life. It's the one that I bow the knee to. 
He's the boss. He says that it goes. How many genders did you create, Curios? Well, just two. That's two for me then. It's like that. It's, it's, it's that level of commitment. You're the boss. Pastor Bill was very fond of saying the master, the master, the master, because that's a great rendering of Lord. We, sometimes we use a word so much that we forget what it actually means. And Lord is boss. Is he your boss? Does he have authority in your life? What is being preached at the church at Sardis? If you preach the Bible, you will preach Christ. If you preach from Dr. Seuss, Christ will not be exalted. Christ will not be exalted. Imagine for a moment, Sunday morning, 9.45, you show up at the church. And in the narthex and at the atrium are tables everywhere. And we give you, Mark, as a survey form and we give you an assignment. And your job is to go to churches all over the city of Fayetteville, Cumberland County, Hope Mills, Rayford, and Spring Lake. And you are to examine the name of the church, the preacher, what text did he preach from, was Christ exalted, was the gospel mentioned? And then you came back at 1215 with your report. What would we find? Would we be horrified with what we found? Would we be in utter shock at the lack of scripture? Would we be so disappointed that Jesus isn't exalted? There's no mention of sin. The cross isn't central. The need for the rebirth is not mentioned. You don't become the church at Sardis overnight. It's a slow, gradual decline in which more and more people in attendance are just simply there. When I say the person and work of Jesus Christ, what do you think about? If I gave you a blank piece of paper and I said to you, tell me about the person and the work of Jesus Christ, would you talk to me about his humanity linked with his deity in an inseparable union that is just mind-boggling, that the God-man became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth, would you talk about the fact that this same Jesus who was sent is coming back again? Would you be able to tell us about this amazing, sinless man who gave his life to redeem humanity from their sin? Would you talk about his role in your life as a prophet? He speaks to you. Would you talk about his role in your life as a priest? He died for your sins. Would you talk about his role in your life as king? He's your Lord. He's your master. I'm trying to explain to you that we are full of of ignorant, absurdly ignorant Christians who know nothing about their Savior. And that's the church at Sardis. That's the church at Sardis. They come weekly. They sit in on a pew. They come weekly. They sit in on a pew. They come weekly. They sit in on a pew. And that's the extent of their walk with the Lord. The extent. In the church at Sardis... In the church at Sardis, salvific belief. That word believe, 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 believe. We've been in John 6. Believe, 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 believe. It's more than intellectual assent. It's more than intellectual assent. Conversion is not emphasized. Ask and answer. Is the absolute necessity of saving faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ emphasized? Is the absolute necessity. So necessity is a great word in of itself. But when you put the word absolute in front of necessity, you are magnifying the necessity. The absolute necessity of saving faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't just say, I believe in Jesus. What does that mean? You say, well, everyone knows what that means. No, everyone doesn't know what that means. This is why we put clarity in words. So when we say gospel, we mean and we only mean it as a very contained, contained definition. It is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for the sins of humanity. That's the gospel. You don't get to redefine it. You don't get to redefine it. You can't have your own gospel, Meredith. There's one true gospel. So just imagine we go back to our survey. Coasties, you're going somewhere, going somewhere. 
and you say, did I hear the gospel, yes or no? Did I hear the gospel, yes or no? Does, was the word gospel mentioned, yes or no? John, what do you think we'd find? What do you think we'd find? Think about what I'm saying. A church our size, we could cover 400 churches. We could cover 400 churches on a Sunday morning. We could hit all the major denominations. And then we could come back and compile our results. Would we take heart in where the evangelical church is? Or would we find ourselves saying there are more and more that are on their way to Sardis? You do understand that if there's a migration of unbelievers in the church, if there's a migration of unbelievers in the church, you're becoming the church of Sardis. In this newsletter that was given to me, they talked about the delegates that were sent to the convention. And the author is frustrated that these delegates are not voting with a biblical perspective. But if the delegates are not born again, why would they vote from a biblical perspective? What would compel them to vote from a biblical perspective? I had a young lady come up to me after the 830 service and she was very concerned. And she said, Pastor Sean, it seems like you're emphasizing works. So is it faith and works? No, no, it's not faith and works. No, no, it's not. It is not faith and works. What saves you? Faith in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the eternal, only begotten Son of God for my sins. That's what saves you. That's what saves you. So let me pull out my wallet by way of illustration. And this is going to be a terrible illustration. So don't come up in front and tell me all about my terrible illustration. I already know it's a terrible illustration. Sometimes finding good illustrations are hard. But this is the front of what, John? What is this the front of? This is the front of a $20 bill. So imagine for a moment that this was laying on the ground. And it was very flat, Marcus, such that you couldn't see the back of it. So you, from a distance, you go, oh, that looks like a $20 bill. And you look around, nobody's watching, okay? And, 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 and you look down, and you, you, know, you kind of do a little slippage there to see if I can get it. And then you pick it up, Marcus, and it's blank on the back. It's blank. Now, this is not blank, but it's blank. Do you understand what I'm trying to illustrate? I'm, I've got this $20 bill, and it's on the ground. You're at the mall. And you don't miss a $20 bill. You ain't picking up a penny. You, ain't pick, you probably won't even pick up a quarter. Maybe there's a few that pick up a quarter. They're dirty, all that nasty currency. But a 20, you're not leaving a 20 on the ground. I'll just tell you that right now. So you walk by and you see it. And you go like this. And it's blank. There's a disappointment. There's an immediate disappointment. You can't tell me that you wouldn't have it because you would. There would be an immediate disappointment. Tell me why, brother. Why would there be an immediate disappointment? Is it real? It's not real. It's worthless. Here, here's my illustration, and it's a terrible illustration. Faith without works is worthless. Faith, works doesn't save you. But works gives evidence of the authenticity of the faith. He says, someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. This is my illustration. The head side of the $20 bill is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. The flip side is the authenticity of the veracity of the faith. Faith that doesn't produce a change is not saving faith. Look, I'm not measuring the change. It's not my job to grade it. I'm not saying I got a little checklist right here to determine how much change. All I'm saying is there is, in fact, change. It changes from different persons. Some is incredible. Some is minor. Minor. It varies from one day to the next. We all have ups and downs. Sometimes we're living on the clouds. Sometimes we're going through valleys. We can have weeks of sin. We can have months of sin. We can have entire years of sin. But he who began a good work in you will perform that work until the day of redemption. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says, that he'll do it. See, if we merely use the word believe, and we should use the word believe, 
but, but, but without emphasis for clarity, then we get this idea right here. And I get this question. I write for God, uh, questions.org. I get uh, nearly every single week I'm answering a question for somebody. One of the most difficult questions I get all the time is, how do I know I'm saved? How do I know I'm saved? So we always start with faith in the gospel. We always start there. That is our starting point, faith in the gospel. Faith is the gospel. And many, many times they will quote this very verse in their question to me. It's not to me directly. They submit it on the website and then they have a computer program that picks the next pastor in line and we just answer the questions as they come. Because they'll say, even the Damians believe. So when we're trying to explain these things, we are not adding to the gospel. We're simply trying to provide clarity. Clarity. That's all. Just clarity. In the church at Sardis, personal holiness is not a priority. Faith without works is acceptable, and progressive sanctification is utterly set aside. Set aside. The expectation that you're supposed to be growing as a Christian is not emphasized. Yet our Bible keeps emphasizing these things. Hebrews 12, 8. If you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. What are you saying? I'm saying if you can cuss somebody out and you're not convicted of the Holy Spirit, you better check your salvation. That's what I'm saying. If you can just be mean and nasty to somebody and you don't walk away going, man, I was mean and nasty. I need to fix that situation. Then there's a problem. If you can go year after year of not paying your taxes, there's a problem. There's a problem. You see, everyone agrees with this. Everyone agrees with this. All they want to do is move the line. What do you mean by that? Now, let me explain this to you. Let me pause right now and explain this to you. I'm struggling with X, Y, or Z, small sin, a minor sin, a little tiny sin, Jim, small sin. Well, you're saved. All right? Let's move it over here. Still saved. Let's move it over here. I'm a serial rapist. You willing to go there? Everybody's got a line. Everybody has a line. Over here, Pastor Sean, you're putting too much emphasis on staying in the faith, pursuing personal holiness, doing good works that represent your salvific faith. It's just, I believe. Just too much emphasis on that. Okay, let's go over here. How far over are you willing to go? I routinely murder people and I love Jesus. I'm involved in a worldwide kidnapping ring in which we uh, capture small children and use them for pornographic movies, and I do it on a regular and consistent basis, but I'm bananas for Jesus. You okay with that? See, you're shaking your head on no on that, aren't you? You know what that means? It means you got a line. That's what it means. You got a line. You're doing the same thing I'm doing. You're doing the same thing I'm doing. you got a line. You just want to move the line to where it's within the bounds of what you're struggling with. That's all you want to do. Where's the stop? A little porn. It's just a little porn. Do you understand where a little porn goes? It's just a hookup. Do you understand where a hookup goes? It's just a little connection on Tinder. Do you know where it goes? You heard that saying, it goes something like, sin will take you yep, further than where you want to go. And it will keep you longer than you want to stay. One thing I found out in 12 years of preaching and in a lifetime of living is be sure your sin will find you out. Man, it's unbelievable how that comes true. I told my wife that twice this week. Be sure your sin, not her sin, don't misunderstand. That, that wasn't the scenario. That's not what I meant. I meant I used that expression in my frustration. In the church of Sardis, person, perseverance is not a priority. Church members is a joke, and church discipline is utterly dead. It's utterly dead. What's the number one esteemed value? It's tolerance. 
We must ask and answer, what does it mean to believe on and in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart? And anytime you try to explain this, it sounds like you're turning faith, a simple childlike faith, into something more. I'm not doing that. I believe with all my heart a four-year-old can come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe with all my heart a seven-year-old can have saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what I am saying is that saving faith will begin to manifest itself in lots of ways. Let me show you. Trust and expectation, dependence and reliance, confidence and conviction, adoration and assurance, gratitude and obedience, self-denial and submission, fellowship and faithfulness. I'm not saying that you have to do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week to be saved. I'm not saying that. But there will be an element when you're saved of self-denial. There will be an element of submission. There will be some fellowship. There will be a faithfulness. And brother, we all have struggles. Sister, we all have struggles. But you can be sure believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is not the same thing as believing that Claritin relieves a runny nose. And yet we use the word synonymous. And we do the same thing with love. And it's a giant problem. I love my wife. I love God and pizza. Right? Do we not use that word exactly like that? We do. We can't use believe the same way. We can't. We do, and that's why we add clarity. So we add. That's one of the reasons why I'm trying to use the word adore more. Because I don't adore pizza. I would never use adore pizza. That would, that, but I adore my wife. I want to adore God. I want to adore God. I want to treasure God. And I think, I think we have parallels like that. We have parables. Remember the guy who finds this precious pearl and he buys the whole field? Buys the whole field. What are you talking about self-denial? Take up your cross and follow me. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourself, that Christ is in you? Is Christ in you? So you virtually in the church can go something like this. Brother, is Christ in you? Yes or no? Sister, is Christ in you? Yes or no? Joe, is Christ in you? Yes or no? You say, I can't believe you're putting people on the spot like that. I can't believe you don't care about their souls enough to ask them a hard question. That's why we have a membership interview around here. Because in the membership interview, we ask you the hard questions. Is it foolproof? Of course it isn't foolproof. Of course it isn't. Do you know Jesus? Are you saved? Have you been born again? Did he make you a new creature in Christ? Have you been transformed by the power of the gospel? Is there clear evidence in your life that you're moving forward in this progressive sanctification? Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And you're going to have to turn there because I intentionally did not build a slide with this text on it because I wanted you to see it in your own Bible. And for this text, I'm going to read from the Net Bible, which is the New English Translation, which I find just incredibly helpful in my study of God's Word. It's the New English Translation. It has unbelievable notes. So let's all turn to 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. So what are we talking about this morning? We're talking about preventing ourselves from becoming the church of Sardis. I'd like to begin reading verse number three. I can pray this, Paul, uh, Peter says, because his divine power has bestowed on us, plural pronoun referring to believers, everything necessary for life and godliness through the rich knowledge of the one who called us by his own glory and excellence. Did you notice the word knowledge right there? That's why I asked you about who Christ is. I asked you about who Jesus is. I asked you about who the Lord is. That's why I asked you, do you know what the gospel is? That's why I asked you these questions, because knowledge matters. Knowledge of the one who called us by his own glory and excellence. Reading in verse 4, through these things he bestowed on us precious and most magnificent 
promises so that by means of what was promised, you and I may become partakers of the divine nature, Christ dwelling in us. After escaping the worldly corruption that is produced by an evil desire, for this very reason, because of these amazing promises whereby you and I may become partakers of the divine nature, for this very reason, make every effort, the King James says, give diligence to add to your faith, I would like to put the word above there, salvific faith, your saving faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the word is excellence. The note is moral excellence, not academic excellence. That, that's not what the Lord's concerned about in this case. It's moral purity, moral excellence. So you're going to take your saving faith and you're going to add some moral excellence. And then on top of that, knowledge. On top of that, knowledge, self-control. On top of that, self-control, perseverance. On top of that, perseverance, godliness. On top of that, godliness, brotherly affection. And on top of that, brotherly affection, unselfish love. So when I'm cussing you out because I don't like you, you're not feeling much brotherly affection, are you? Verse number 8. For if these things are really yours and continually increasing, they, these things, these seven things, will keep you from becoming ineffective and unproductive in your pursuit of knowing Jesus Christ. But concerning the one who lacks such things, moral excellence, knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, perseverance in the faith, godliness, unselfish love, brotherly affection, the one that lacks these things, okay, he's blind. That is to say, he's nearsighted since he's forgotten about the cleansing of his past sins. Now I read 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 to get us to 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, that's us this morning, we are to make every effort to make sure or to be sure of our calling and election. I cannot provide you any assurance of faith out part of, from this word. So you say to me, I'm struggling with knowing I'm saved. Elizabeth, I would never say to you, well, did you pray? Or did you mean it? Or were you sincere? Those would be all empty things. Instead, I would want to take you to a Bible text and ask you, since you put saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, have you found yourself adding these things to the faith? Do you have more self-control to avoid pornography now than you did a year ago and five years ago? Pick another thing, whatever you want to pick. Money management, um, uh, fraud, um, habitually lying, um, looking at other women with lustful eyes. Just, just goes down the laundry list. Is it your pet sin? No, that's not what we're doing here this morning. What we are saying is there is a growth there's a legitimate growth. And he doesn't say, just rely on this. He says, instead, make every effort, make every effort to be sure of your calling and election. For by doing this, you will never stumble into sin. So this young lady comes up to me this morning in the 10, 830 service, and she just has this sweet spirit about herself. And she is so concerned that because she grew up in the church and she hasn't had this life of sin to be rescued out of, that maybe her faith is just an intellectual ascent, that it's not real. And I told that little sister in Christ, I said, do you understand how comforted this pastor is in knowing that you're concerned? Because a spiritually dead person is not concerned. A spiritually dead person is not concerned. The very idea that she wants to know, do I really adore God? Do I really love God? 
That sensitivity gives you assurance. Not perfect assurance. Not foolproof assurance. But it gives you amazing hope. It gives you amazing hope. Wow. Is that clock wrong? Oh my goodness. Number three. We have to make spirit-filled, exegetical preaching stronger. In other words, we have to preach the Bible. We have to preach the Bible. When we say spirit-filled, that's not just added words. We need the Holy Spirit to come here. We need the Holy Spirit to do only what the Spirit can do. We need John 3, that which is born from above, is born of the Spirit. Yes, we preach the Word. Yes, we do. And I would submit to you that when the preacher believes the Bible is inspired by God and is preserved word of God, good for teaching, correction, reproof, and instruction, then he can boldly insist that the people obey the book. But when you've lost your confidence in the book, when you've lost your confidence in the book, then preaching becomes lessons, discussions, encouragement, pithy little sayings, helpful nuggets, like Polite people do better. Now, that is absolutely true. There's no question polite people do better. There's no question about that. That's a great little thing. But we're not going to build a sermon around polite people do better. Why? Because we preach not ourselves. Personal stories are minimized in these churches. Preaching politics is pointless. Persuasion is the work of the Lord. And power comes from the Spirit of God. We're not going down that road of politics. Not going there. In this church, Democrats and Republicans both agree Jesus is Lord. Amen. And that's what unites us. Paul said, I did not shrink from declaring the whole council. When you preach the whole council, you get the hard chapters like Matthew 7. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one that does the will of my Father. Does the will of my Father. Does the will of my Father. That's why I'm saying to you that the Bible does not allow us to put the front of a 20 bill and then flip it over and have it be blank. The Bible doesn't allow us to do that. The Bible does not me. This is not Baptist ideas. This is this right here. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Amen. It is a gift of God. Did you notice that the Bible doesn't stop there? Instead, verse 10 says that you were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Flip the $20 bill over and that's the back side of the $20 bill. Saving faith is a gift from God unequivocally. And saving faith produces good works. Not perfectly, not 24 hours a day, not like a checklist. And if you get enough of them, you get saved. You're already saved. Number four, and we'll stop here. Make authentic worship stronger. Amen. Stronger. Now, I'm defining worship in a limited sense right now, and I'm defining it with the sense of singing, praising God, loving God, adoring God. I know there are other definitions of worship. I know it's larger than that, but I'm, I'm kind of focusing on this one particular area. By show of hands and use a good hand, Pastor John, I've been in a dead church before. I've been in a dead church before. I've been in a dead church before. Did you feel it in the worship? It's absent. It's absent. You can tell. You can tell when the people are singing like they believe it. You can tell when they're singing with their heart. You can tell who are and who aren't the true worshipers. John 4, 23, the hour is coming and is now is when the true worship will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Amen. They'll worship. You're worthy. Do I have to have my hands raised? No, you don't have to have your hands raised. But they better be raised in your heart. They better be raised in your heart. You know what's in your heart when we're singing. It's why reading your bulletin drives me crazy when we're singing Imagine for a moment that we get one of those cameras and we have it up there. And there's a monitor back there. And when you're not worshiping, zooms right in on you and bam, right there on the screen. We can see what's on your phone. We can see what you're reading. Or let's take it a step farther. 
Let's create some digital connectivity between God the Father and the church. What do you mean digital connectivity? Here we go, right here. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. So just imagine digital connectivity link between God the Father and the true worshipers in the empty church. And along the bottom of the screen, Jeff, is this rolling banner of who's not worshiping. Rolling banner. You know what I'm talking about. Just names. And we look up there, John Dayton. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Trying to use a fun illustration right now to emphasize that when you've been saved, you actually want to worship God. Amen. You want to worship God. I've been singing over and over again. I'd like us to sing it a little bit more, John. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice. Listen to this words. Take joy, my king. Listen to it. In what you hear, let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Sing that this week. Sing it. You say, I don't know that song. Google it and just play it on YouTube. Just play it. Make that the song of the week for you. Just go down the road, turn off. Fox News and all that nonsense. You ain't fixing Washington, and Washington ain't fixing anything. <laughs> Bottom line. Take a nice break and just start off with, I love you, Lord. I love you. And I'm going to sing to you. I'm going to sing to you off tune. Amen. But I'm going to sing to you. Right. Turn the radio off. Turn the music off. Turn the nonsense off. You know, you always hear about challenges. How about a seven-day challenge that once a day, for the next seven days, sometime during the day, I'm going to sing to the Lord, I love you. That's such a simple little chorus for us to learn. Such a simple little chorus. And it says so much. It starts off with, I love you, Lord. Let's pray. God, you told us that the greatest of the great commandments is that we would love you with all our heart, mind, soul, being. How can we say that we love you and not sing to you? How can we say that we love you and not express to you a heart that adores you, affections that well within us that let you know, I love you, Lord. I love you. Do you love God this morning? Amen. I love you, Lord. And I want you to know that I love you. God, bless the preaching and teaching of your word in this church. In Jesus' name, amen.